calls everyone, everywhere, to repent. Now is the time. You've got to say, look, sin's got to go. It's got to go in the mass. Can't continue saying, yeah, I, I follow Jesus Christ, I follow God. When there's sin here, it's got to be dealt with. If you're proclaiming to be a Christian, you've got to turn away from your sin and follow God. And there's a, there's a verse, it's also a hymn, a very good hymn. Holy, holy, holy. Notice, by the way, three times it's mentioned there. I need to say it's a, a reference to the Trinity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. There's a holiness of God. The Apostle Paul says, Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God. Romans 11, 22. So there's a, there's a goodness, there's a mercy, a kindness, a benevolence about God. There's also a severity and a punishment for sin and a judgment of sin. Um, particularly you can see it with the children of Israel who, as they came out of Egypt. The Bible says that their, their, their carcasses, their bodies fell in the desert, in the wilderness because of unbelief in God because, and of course because of their idolatry, turning away from God. And uh, Paul goes on to say, on them which fell, that is in the wilderness, severity, but toward thee, towards you, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Again, Romans 11, 22. So that is what God is like. He is loving, he's kind, he's benevolent, but at the same time there's a severity, as, as the Bible puts it, through God, a severity that will punish um, sin if you don't repent of it. If you don't turn back to God. That's what he's like. But where does God dwell? Where does he live? Isaiah 66 says this, verse 1 to 2. The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. And uh, Stephen said, The Most High dwelleth not in temples, made with hands. I've always thought that's interesting because that's in Acts 7. He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Do you know who else quotes that verse in the New Testament? Anybody know? A little bit later in Acts, Acts 17, Paul says exactly the same thing. God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands as if he needed anything. And so I mean, he goes on and he talks about how God uh, made all people from, from one, one blood, from one person, and so on. And the, the times and the boundaries where they were to dwell and live. But what's interesting is that when Stephen quotes it, he stood before the, the leaders in Jerusalem. He's about to be stoned. And who's standing there giving his approval? Saul, as he was. And then interesting, isn't it, that when he becomes Paul, he takes the very same verse that Stephen quoted. And now, now Paul's quoting it. Mary Opus taking the same verse, same thing. He, he'd come to an understanding. Look, God doesn't live in a temple. That's not where he is. And even if you think about you know, the temple of Solomon, which is an incredibly ornate temple, uh, the house of God, as it was termed, and, you know, he, he, he built it with all those um, workmen who were so skilled in, in all different kinds of crafts and art. And it would have been an amazing thing to see. Very ornate. Uh, and yet, Solomon himself says, Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have built it. 1 Kings 8, 27. So, even Solomon understood, you, you can't contain God in a building. You know, and, you know, that's not the house of God. We looked at it last week, talking about how believers are like living stones built into a temple, aren't we? Where, you know, this is not Stockport Wesleyan Church. This is a building. It, it, it's, it's just somewhere where we're holding this meeting. That it's believers who are the temple of God, built on the living foundation stone of Jesus Christ. So, uh, but it's strange, it kind of, that mentality, and I suppose it's a kind of pagan mentality, really, still stays with me. And, and you go to one of these old Gothic churches or something, and you might be talking away to your friend, you know, and you're having a good conversation, and you come to go in the church, and I'm like, you're starting to be because you're doing We're going to the sanctuary now. You know, you don't want to wake God, just in case he's in there. But it, people have this mentality, don't they? 
and it, it, it's it's they even call part some people even call parts of their church the sanctuary you know as if this is a special part of the building now well no it's not it's where believers are together jesus christ is in their midst so i'm not saying that you know when we come in here we should be hey kick a football around or something we're coming into the presence of god but that's not to do with the building that's to do with the fact that we are assembled in god's name and we're here to, to do business with god to meet with him we're here for serious for a serious matter not for a sort of trifling matter not just to meet our friends god doesn't dwell in a building it doesn't it's not his his house and you know these big ornate kind of churches are built to kind of give the impression that he does aren't they? i mean Kirsty and i went on our honeymoon we go to paris and went in uh, Notre Dame Cathedral there, and it's pitch black, you can't see anything, you go in, and it, it's so dark and quiet, and you know, you're sort of squinting, and even there's little signs that say, be careful, uh, pickpockets, because they take advantage of that, the fact that it's so dark, you know, lift your wallet out, so, but, I mean, some people, they like to go into an old church lab, because it's quiet, well, Notre Dame's are quiet, I can tell you that, with all the tourists, but, these old uh, uh, churches, sometimes they are quiet, and you can sit there, and you can meditate and think about God. So that's a good thing. You know, if, if that helps, you go there and, and you know, um, and think about God, meditate on Him, and, and, and you can meet Him. Well, you can meet God out on the street. You can go and hear an evangelist or something, and you can meet God there and then. You don't have to be in a special building to meet with God. You know, you can meet God up on the hills. Go out, go for a walk right up in the hills. Uh, you know, Dominic and I were talking about being at Wine Park and that, how nice it is up there. Go, he goes running. I'm not quite up to that. Well, I, I'll go for a walk. You know, and you can meet God there, just in the peace and tranquility and the creation that's around you. But God doesn't live in a building. Neither, by the way, and you might think this is controversial. Neither does He live in your Bible. That's right. He, he doesn't live in the pages of the Bible. This is God's testimony. And when the Spirit of God moves upon it, it becomes a living word. It is God's holy word. I don't say this to, in a way of disrespect to the word of God. I stand on the word of God and believe every single thing it says. Well, God is not floating around in it. Otherwise, people who go and study the Bible and, uh, and you know, study it for three or four years or so, uh, they would all find God, wouldn't they? But they don't. You can even be a professor of theology and have never encountered the living God. You can become an expert in Bible study. You can know the Bible back to front. You can know all about it. Who wrote it? Who he wrote it to? When it was written? What the main themes of it are? And so on and so on. You can know all that and still not know God. So that's why James says it's not the hearers of the word. It's not those who read it and hear it. But it's those who do what it says. What do we read in Hebrews? That you must, first of all, believe that God is. And secondly, that you must diligently seek Him. And believe that He's going to reward that search, that seeking. And so, you know, that's what, uh, uh, that's where God does not dwell. doesn't dwell in those things. They, they, they just become substitutes for God, really, for some people. Just like... Uh, it's just as bad as having relics and things like that, thinking they have some holy property within themselves. Uh, they don't. The Word of God is precious because the Word of God is true. It's God's revealed Word. But unless you do what it says, unless you apply faith to it, believe the promises of God, it will do you no harm. Where does God dwell? And it might lead us to the next and my final question. Which is this, what does he want with me? What does God want with me? He wants to dwell in your heart. That's what he wants. Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him. And he will come unto him and make our abode with him. John 14, 23. Abode is, is home, isn't it? You know, uh, you've heard, welcome to my humble abode. Abode, it, it's home. It's a word. He'll make, we'll make our home with him. That's what God wants. He makes.